Hey guys, Hop here. Brassfax and I both got on a long-range 5.56 kick recently, so we built out some SPRs and spent a couple days shooting them in the desert. After the action, we recorded our conversation about why we built the rifles, how we set them up, and what we would change based on the lessons learned during the shoot. This is like a video edition of the semi-regular podcast Brassfax and I do, which is available to you if you support either of us on Subscribestar. So if you like listening to me and my heterosexual life partner Brassfax have friendly arguments about guns, gear, and 1990s disaster movies, check that out. Links are in the video description. Let's get into it. Paint me, paint me like one of your French SPRs. Yeah! So you and I both recently put together SPRs to uh, do some long-range shooting with 5.56. I think you retrofitted an existing rifle, and I built one from the ground up, but we both ended up with similar rifles, similar optic setups, and we went and shot them uh, at long range in the desert for two days. It's an interesting, debatably niche setup with the existence of the LPVO, but I'd argue that it does have its niche, and for some that niche might not be there, especially if funds are tight, but uh, it's a really cool Cool setup, right? And we did notice some difference out there. Yeah, so first thing we have to talk about what the point of the SPR is. And we also have to point out that we're not talking about making clones of the military special purpose receiver, although there's a similar philosophy behind it. I think since you've already made some videos about this, I'll sort of give my version. But the SPR is sort of a, a way to extend the usable range of 5.56 without compromising the utility of, I guess, what you'd call a fighting rifle. So the SPR needs to remain light and mobile enough to still be, you know, easily portable. So that's the reason that we're not stepping it up to 308, and that's the reason why we make some deliberate concessions for weight, sacrificing capability. Because at the end of the day, we have to be honest with ourselves. We're not talking about home defense anymore. We're talking about a scenario I'll let your imagination go wild on that. But at the end of the day, none of us are running in platoon size elements. A dedicated sniper person is less of a reality in my opinion. So the ability for every person to be effective as, like you said, a fighting rifle is a, a desirable thing to have. So if we are going for that long range capability, in my opinion, it can't be at the expense of having a functional fighting rifle, right? There is a role for a 308, and I think Hop and myself are, are going to dabble in that. But sometimes 556 is the answer, and that's where the, the SPR kind of slides in. I would argue a lot of people view it as a longer range setup than a general purpose rifle with an LPVO. I would argue it's not necessarily a longer range setup than that. It's more of a case of being an easier rifle to use at long range than a setup like that. Yeah, so what we're trying to do, I think, is find the middle ground uh, between the 5.56 and the 308, push 5.56 to its, its extremes, and not quite take that last step to 308. So we get some of the benefits of 5.56, we get a lighter rifle, we get lighter ammunition, less recoil, uh, more ammunition carried on body because it's smaller. But we also get maybe a little more usable range or uh, more effectiveness at range than you would with just an LPVO. And a big part of that is optic selection. And I think that's, that's kind of a big topic for this video because you and I both, I think, spent the most time and effort thinking about and choosing the optics. And the rifle itself was, a, I mean, very... Very turnkey, very boilerplate. Like, we both built similar rifles. They're just standard ARs, you know, in almost all ways. Because, again, we're not talking about some weird carbon fiber monolithic top rail thing like the military SPR. We just built ARs and stuck optics on them. Everyone says the barrel is the heart of the rifle, and that's technically true. But in a lot of ways, I believe the optic is kind of the heart of the rifle because it dictates how the rifle gets used and how where it excels at and where it doesn't excel at. So I spent a lot of time, and you did as well. I mean, we discussed, we came to the, the similar conclusions, and you were a big part of why I went with the route I did on what optic makes sense on a rifle, as discussed, that needs to make shooting at long range easier, but also still needs to retain some capability uh, up close. Yeah, so we both ended up with very similar optics. We both ended up with a two and a half to ten by forty-four optic. Although the actual, I mean, the specifics of those optics are wildly different. Uh, and we can talk at the very end of the video, I think, 
uh, if we were happy with that selection. Two and a half to ten, or just in that general range, two-ish to ten-ish. You know, maybe it could be three to twelve. But I think we're trying to sort of split the difference. A two-ish power low end is pretty good. You know, maybe between fifty and a hundred yards or so. It's not at all close to the 1x on an LPVO or a red dot, but it is, I guess, two benefits. One, quick engagements at close range, but second, the ability to back the uh, magnification way off for target location and then crank it up to engage. Maybe I was a little optimistic thinking I could get the job done with 10x. We'll talk about that later. But we both, I think, ran into this issue where the sc- you know we, have, we had an idea of what we wanted out of a scope. And the medium variable optic category in the market is really getting kind of lost in the mix between, you know, long range precision optics and then the LPVOs, which are dominating the market. There are not really all that many choices in the uh, sort of the medium range scope category that fit all the boxes that we're looking for. Because we can talk about this a little bit. I went with second focal plane. You went with first focal plane. Both of us, I think, ended up with a scope that is easy to dial, which is a pretty important thing. My criteria is essentially I want locked turrets, but I want to be able to dial because we're expecting to be like carrying this rifle around, maybe strapping it to your back, maybe pulling it in and out of a bag. You know, it's sort of a, it's an active use rifle. It's not like a bench rest toy. So you really don't want those turrets to move on you, but you still want exposed turrets that you can use to dial because we are expecting to take long range shots. We definitely want a parallax adjustment because if you don't have parallax adjustment, then even the tiniest head movement at long range has a significant impact on your uh, ability to make hits. I was willing to compromise. I didn't really need a first focal plane reticle. I didn't really need a complicated reticle. And I said no to illumination. I just didn't bother with that at all. So the scope that I ended up with was a Bushnell Engage 2.5 to 10 by 44 which is a a much cheaper optic, probably half the price of your scope. And it's a second focal plane, very basic MOA grid reticle, like no Christmas tree, no fancy stuff, just a, you know, an MOA grid. The thing that I liked about it was that it has exposed locking turrets. You can pull them up, dial them, and then you can push them back down and they lock. Decent glass, adjustable parallax, lightweight, probably weighs just under 20 ounces. Seemed like a pretty good idea. We picked really similar things. I did the uh, 2.5 to 10x primary arms. I don't remember the full name. GLX, SLX, WLX. GLX with either a Griffin, Raptor, Apollo, uh, Dynamite. God, the uh, Dynamite reticle. reticle. Yeah, sorry. I, I can't keep track of these reticles, but it's the Pluto. The, the Mill Radian Christmas tree style reticle. Ultimately, I don't really see an issue with how you described the use case because that's my main use case i want to dial therefore i don't really need the christmas tree as much and i need locking turrets because like i said or like you said we're going to be moving around a lot and i mean you were having this glorious experience with the i think the gen 1 pst and those turrets are just like spinning under their own power like they're not even touching anything so you know you do some uh extraneous activities right because you're shooting a long range scope you're going to be moving around a lot obviously otherwise you wouldn't need that long range uh so locking turrets were absolutely mandatory so that's that's present on the primary arms the weight was somewhat good i I don't remember the exact weight i think it was like 24 ounces or something like that which feels like a lot when you compare to lpvos but considering how big this thing is it, it ends up actually being all right for the medium variable power optic category the scope offers a little bit more with a first focal plane design combined with the reticle i don't really think there's a point with um second focal plane with a simplistic or sorry first focal plane with a simplistic reticle ranging makes more sense to me by just doing the math versus trying to compare at different magnification levels and since we're dialing I, i i'm not i don't really care about the reticle size difference First focal plane is a combination with the reticle because it allows me to have something at the lower magnification that is usable in a more running gun type scenario. But then when I dial up, I have that Christmas tree, which I'm not really shooting with the Christmas tree per se, but it affords me some utility in terms of being able to rapidly re-engage if I miss the first shot into a combat spoiler essentially, or spotting for someone else with a bigger caliber. Like I was spotting with 308 the other, like a, a month ago. And you see it and you instantly see what the drop is with the reticle. 
and calling the adjustments is beautiful because you know exactly what it is by looking at it. Yeah, and I wouldn't say that the choice of first focal plane or second focal plane really has anything to do with the SPR. It's more like something internal to the scope. Like, does the choice of first focal plane make sense of the scope? So, for example, if you have a really simple grid reticle with, without, or even a duplex reticle, no ability to really make effective holds, and you have capped turrets so you can't dial, okay, well, that's not a good choice of scope because it, it doesn't give us you know, anything we need. So it's more a case of does the scope make sense as a whole as opposed to kind of getting lost in the sauce and basically saying, well, I have to have a scope with a 2x on the low end because that's an SPR scope. Like, no, not really. I mean, a 2 to 10 is a good, is a decent fit for, you know, the rifle that we're trying to build or the, you know, the, uh, the mission we're trying to accomplish. But it doesn't have to be 2 to 10. It doesn't have to be first or second focal plane. Yeah, the, the other guy we came out with had a, um, what was it, a 3 to 15, right? And four, 4 to 16. A 4 to 16. And... I think I'll say it. I think he he smoked us. <laughs> yeah, that's that's. I think we might have to get into this at the uh, sort of the end. The what would we do differently? But I I don't know if my optics choice was the best. Um, you mentioned reticle, like the reticle on uh, the engage is pretty thick, and it at close range at lower magnification settings that's great because it's it's highly visible and it's fast. At longer range, I felt like it obscured too much of the target. And the other thing that we both did was also piggyback a red dot. And I used, uh, I mounted the scope in a Leupold Mark AR mount, and the Leupold Mark AR mount has an option to replace one of the top turret rings with a ring that will directly mount a micro red dot with a Delta Point Pro footprint on the top or on the offset. So I ended up with a Bushnell RXS 250 red dot mounted on the 45 degree offset of the top ring. You ended up with a RMR. RMR, 12 o'clock exactly. The LaRue, who knows what it's called. And so we, we went with that. My theory initially was that I would use that for passive aiming with night vision. What was the issue under passive? Was it the, the optic choice? Was it the lack of lighting? I think it ends up being just a problem of clearances. Whether I mounted it on top, or I tried it both on top and on the 45 degree offset. And I've also tried using standalone offset red dot mounts as well. None of them have ever really worked for me all that well when it comes to passive aiming. Like, there's so much scope in the way, and a night vision monocular binocular system is already pretty big. It's usable, but it's not intuitive. It's not all that fast. It, it is still an option. Maybe that's one of the main differences between the SPRs that we put together versus the military SBR. We're not trying to do everything with this, so both of us in our you know setups, we kind of forewent most night vision capability the option is on the table like the obvious answer is obvious put a laser aiming module up top but to me there is a sweet spot for rifle weight and that is 10 pounds or less and as soon as you start to exceed 10 pounds or left less you're exponentially affecting the ability to use it as a fighting rifle under 100 yards yeah if you think about you yourself as having a weight budget we're putting extra weight into our optic. This is a bigger, heavier optic than we would normally throw on a rifle or a rifle of this caliber. And if you also put a laser on there and also put a white light on there, you kind of get into that mission creep thing of like, okay, now we got way too much crap hanging off of this gun. Yeah, so, it's not necessarily the total weight, though it, that is a factor of it. It's where the weight is located. And we haven't mentioned this, but the bipod to me is a critical component of what makes this thing work. Mm -hmm. And the bipod and the laser aiming module makes this thing ludicrously nose heavy. It's already nose heavy because it's a longer barrel. Considering the, the goal of this rifle, we have the ability to aim under night vision if we have to, if push comes to shove. That's why that red dot is there. Yeah, and these rifles are not general purpose rifles. We're not expecting to be able to do everything with them. As far as the rest of the like rifle build, um, I went a little non-traditional because I was building one from scratch, so I felt like just having some fun with it i built mine around a ballistic advantage 17.7 inch hansen i know 18 inches the classic spr barrel length for you know reasons that aren't entirely well explained but i went with a 17.7 because i was curious about those barrels handguard is an alg v3x 13 inches again i think there's a temptation for guys to go with that handguard that's almost as long as the barrel because it looks cool you know gets the light all the way out at the end but generally speaking at least in this application that's just wait for no reason 
The only, I think, important changes or the important additions to the rifle is signature reduction, although not necessarily sound suppression. We want a bipod. We both ended up with Magpul bipods. And you want a good trigger. So I think, do we both end up with uh, LaRue MBT-2S triggers? Actually, this is my Geisley rifle. <laughs> oh, ooh, yeah. fancy. This was my main squeeze rifle for a long time before it became an SPR, so... Yours is a real 18-inch, right? Yeah, so mine, it's it's pretty standard with a twist. With it, It's basically the 2015, everyone and their mother made an SPR. And it kind of ended up fitting the perfect goal I had in mind for an SPR, and you had in mind for an SPR. Uh, pencil weight, Rainier Arms barrel. Lightweight Midwest handguard. We're not putting anything on it, so who cares about barrel flex or rail flex or whatever flex. Nice trigger. I do really like the adjustable sock. I know the boat paddle uh, M16 rifle length stock is, you know, the, the stereotypical thing. But the reality is I'm either prone in where I want the stock longer. I'm either shooting, I want the stock shorter, or I'm braced off of an object somewhere in between. Flash hider, I'm probably not putting a can on it, though I do have that ability should I show, so choose, but generally I'm not running suppressed. And then Magpul Bipod. It's lighter than the Atlas. It has a little less capability, but it's not necessarily needed. And I do enjoy the the weight reduction and the cost reduction, to be blunt. Yeah, it doesn't hurt that it's a lot cheaper than an Atlas Bipod. Yeah, and that's that's really about it. This is a less is more setup. So mine has a, a VG6 Delta flash hider, which could just as easily have been an A2 birdcage. I mean, they're both essentially equally effective, particularly on a long barrel. Flash suppression is no longer that difficult of a job. I didn't really care about being able to mount a suppressor, so that's just the way that is. Yours has a weapon light. Mine has a weapon light. I ended up using a Surefire M600 Vampire. The theory being that if it was too dark, and I needed to passive aim with this piggyback red dot, I could also use IR illumination without adding really any weight at all. So the vampire seems like a good idea, a good choice. It, it's extra cost, or extra monetary cost, but almost no downsides to using a vampire over most weapon lights. Having run the ACOG uh, piggyback stack, which is similar but slightly higher, running this, I almost never... Ever. And I'm I'm comf comfortable with a piggyback ACOG. I almost never use that red dot in a CQB setting. There are certain scenarios where I would use the red dot, but it's almost not really there for CQB. If cost is a big limiting factor, then it's probably okay to omit that piggyback optic. However, since they are so lightweight, I mean, really, you're talking one or two ounces for the optic. If money is no object, go ahead and toss that into the mix because it does have some utility, but it's not critical. So we shot these rifles for uh, two days in some pretty significant elevation in the desert. What was the maximum range that we ended up going out to? It's probably about 600, right? Yeah, like 620 or something, I forgot. Yeah, so right around 600 yards where we, we topped out. And I know there's this oft-repeated meme about, oh, you know, you need 1x per 100 yards, right? I will say that at 600 yards... 6x would not have done it not for seeing the target not for identifying the target and not really for you know accurately engaging the target even 10x at 600 yards seemed like it you know it was borderline to me i think if you can get a first round hit uh i've been doing it with like elkans acogs and all that if you get a first round hit i don't think it actually matters you can run a 4x 6x 8x 10x the issue is if you miss with the 4x at 600 yards, you're shit out of luck. You're like, you can't make a personal correction. You're done. <laughs> out to about 500, I was still able to make pretty effective first round hits. Once we got to the 600 mark, the wind was also picking up a little bit. And at the 600 mark, I felt like I was just shooting a cone of bullets around the target. In fairness, this, this sounds like excuses, but that was a weird wind day. We were kind of like shooting over a valley. And the wind we were experiencing was the opposite of the wind call. And the wind call wasn't very much. Um, I think we were effectively dialing, or not dialing, calling for, in my experience, roughly 5 mile an hour or less. But we were feeling 10 mile an hour winds or more in the opposite direction. It was very hard to tell what's going on in terms of wind and because where we were shooting, it's just sagebrush and you can't tell what direction that is going because it doesn't move. It was a very awkward situation. There were times at the 600 mark where 
uh, it, more than once. I sh- I took two shots with the exact same hold, and I hit both sides of the target, uh, on either side of the target. That's, a, I think, a combination of the rifle accuracy at that range, my accuracy as a shooter at that range, and the wind being significant enough and changeable enough that it, it became pretty difficult. And also, I was shooting pretty Gucci ammunition. I was shooting exclusively 69 grain ADI Sierra Match Kings, whereas you were shooting cheaper ammunition. I was running ball ammunition, so I would have good moments and bad moments. Some of that was me, and some of that was the the, the accuracy of the platform. We were shooting 620, and I'm I, I get about 1.5. MOA. Some of that is accuracy issues, and you begin to feel that here. I think around 500 is where your accuracy with the uh, you were shooting green tips, basically, right? It, literally green tips. Yep. Yeah. So you were shooting SS109 green tip or MA55 around 500 yards. Before that, I think we all were doing pretty solid. Around 500 yards, I felt like I started to pull away from you a little bit, and then at 600 yards, I think neither of us was doing all that well compared to uh, Cameraman 43. But I still think some part of his ability to make hits or make corrections and you know follow up hits after a miss, I think some of that was down to the magnification because he has way more magnification to play with than we do. He's got a four to sixteen as opposed to us topping out at ten. At ten x, you're beginning to just hold on the target instead of hold on a specific part of the target. I think that's really what it comes down to is that you know the reticles are thick enough and the magnification is low enough that your variation is is more significant. We both had acceptable performance out to the 500 for sure. 600 things started to get a little weird. Some of that might have been the wind, but even without the wind, I think 600 was getting, you know, getting kind of up there in what the what the rifles and the scopes were really capable of in terms of first round hits, repeatable hits. The idea that you could go much beyond that without stepping up in ammunition selection and probably with magnification level seems a little dubious. I think people tend to overestimate what they can do with low levels of magnification or with, you know, uh, just lightweight ball ammunition. Obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm number one ACOG Elkan simp, so to a degree there will always be some disagreement. But yeah, fundamentally, when the whole point of an SPR is to create a system that makes shooting at range easier more magnification makes makes it easier right and that's all we care about is hit probability such that if you're not going to get that very likely first round hit you should at least get that second round hit we shot these alongside some rifles with lpvos lightweight prisms red dots there is absolutely a world of difference between a you know a stable bipod nice trigger high magnification scope rifle and a you know general purpose rifle with an lpvo i mean the the ease of making the hits the ease of getting on target it carries you a long way i'd say 250 yards on a general purpose lpvo rifle is comparable to about 400 450 500 even on a spr and the barrel length really is not even almost not at play at all because you know you have an 18 inch i have a 17 7 we shot against you know a 16 inch the velocity differences are not that significant the accuracy differences may well as well not exist so really that is all in the optic right that is all in the the stability of the platform and the ability to identify the target the barrel length is to me every, everyone always mentions like what are you doing shooting 11.5 at range it's like to me Barrel length is le- a conversation about lethality and, and lethality only at, for 5.56 five, at 800. And uh, when you go transonic, okay, we can start talking, but most of you are not doing that. My thoughts with barrel length is something I, I'm sure I've said before that if you have a 16 inch rifle and you need more magnification, then put more scope on your 16 inch rifle or your 14.5 or your 12.5. It's okay to put a scope on a shorter gun, right? That's not really critical. The reason that I think we went 17, you know, 17, 7, 18 inch is if you're building something from the ground up, okay, maybe, maybe you build a suit then. But it's not like it needed to be an 18 inch. We could have both just put those scopes onto 16 inch rifles or shorter rifles, and we could have done 99% of the same stuff. Yeah. I mean, there is a legitimate argument to running a, you know, 13, 7 inch barrel with a can such that you natively have a can on the gun 
for your SPR. So that leads us kind of into the, uh, you know, the what will you change about your SPR going forward? Or if you were going to build an, you know, money, no object, build an entirely new rifle from scratch to suit the same purpose, what would you do differently? I want to try more magnification. Because magnification was absolutely really nice. I was running a one by eight or one to eight scope, and that was really nice compared to the shorter range optic scopes. Not necessarily because of my ability to make hits, but it's just it's nicer to see more, right? We had a guy making hits with red dots out to three hundred yards, but <laughs> there are some funny clips on the internet now of him just not even being able to see anything. That's really what it comes down to. So I, I wouldn't mind trying something with a little more magnification at some point. Uh, the biggest thing is I eventually do want to try precision ammunition. I've tried it in small quantities, but I want to see, most importantly, how much I gain, right? In a scientific manner, I cap out at about seven to 600 yards right now. I've gone to 800, but it was kind of a shit show. So a seven to 600 yards, depending on the wind conditions, is where I cap out with green tip and this specific setup with 10X. I felt like I benefited from having the match ammunition. This is the first time that I've actually run match ammo in quantity because probably like most people, you know, I would buy it as a curiosity. Like, oh, I will shoot some groups with some federal gold medal match just to see what my gun can do. Oh, look, it's sub MOA with gold medal match. How fascinating. Well, that's all the gold medal match I have for it, literally for the rest of my whole life. Back to shooting Tula Steel, right? Like, it's a it's a weird curiosity that people get hung up on. They're like, oh, my rifle will do sub MOA with this ammo that I haven't had for two years and can't afford. Like, oh, who cares? So, yeah, if you are going to invest in a quantity of match ammunition you come to rely on that performance and you have it zeroed for that and then you're going to have to keep that ammo in stock it does give you i think just a little more leeway you know it allows you to to suck a little harder on your own you know or to get a little t more tired from walking up a mountain yeah hypothetically if you wanted to go to a thousand yards with 556 which is doable for uh, studs the ball ammos don't quite make it out that far they run out of juice, hit the transonic, and do backflips. Yeah, our 600-yard shooting was far from a worst-case scenario. Or the, I mean, it's absolutely worse than I think what most people do. You know, they go to a known distance range. They shoot massive steel plates from a very comfortable bench. Oh, yeah, I guess it's worth mentioning. We were shooting at a... What's your small one? Uh, yeah, so we had an 8x10 target. Most of the time we were shooting, we had an 8x10 mini silhouette, and we had a 10x12 silhouette. You know, 600 yards, uh, 8 by 12 is a, is that a less than 2 MOA target? It's small. It's pretty small. And we also had to hike up the side of a mountain. We were shooting at pretty extreme angles, far from the worst case scenario because we still had all the time in the world. We were still just relaxing, having a nice sunny day. So it could have been definitely worse. And 600 became difficult in nice, you know, in a nice scenario. So yeah, you're, I think you're, I think you're right on the money there. So yeah, so if I was going to uh, modify my, my rifle or start over, uh, the modification that I intend to make the rifle kind of minor, one is absolutely more magnification. I want to go to a 4 to 16. Um, part of that is because I think, you know what, like the 2-ish two, to 2.5 range is nice for the close range work, but, you know, again, I already committed to putting the red dot on there, so that is a fallback option. So maybe a 4 on the low end isn't really going to cost me much. 16 on the high end will absolutely be a lot better and there are plenty of 4 to 16 scopes that are still reasonably lightweight uh, strangely enough the market for 4 to 16 scopes hasn't suffered like the market for 2 to 10 scopes you know due to the lpvo revolution and all that stuff so i think it's actually easier to find a 4 to 16 scope that sort of fits our bill one thing I think both of us kind of want to do is replace our Magpul bipods with the new Magpul MOE bipod that's supposed to come out soon. And then be immediately disappointed and go back? Yeah, I mean, it's probably not going to be super solid or anything, but it is lighter. And I think, you know, again, weight at the end of the rifle, as you said, is significant enough that I would like to cut a few more ounces off the front of the gun. That's if I was modifying the rifle. If I was going to design a ground-up rifle based on the experiences of our of our little uh, shoot, our SPR shoot, I think I would do some of the stuff that you talked about. Like I think I would probably put that four to sixteen scope onto a shorter gun, like a fourteen five, you know, pin and weld with a suppressor. Like I think that would actually be probably a better option because there's some other, you know, the benefits of a suppressor: pleasant shooting, 
signature reduction, and we don't really lose anything. We still get all the benefits of the of the scope that we're we're working with. We are still shooting expensive match ammunition. I'm not going to go restless gun syndrome here. I'd like to try a four to sixteen more for personal curiosity, but I actually really do like the two to ten or two point five to ten. The goal, you know, tie it back to the start. The goal was ultimately to have a fighting rifle that gives up a little bit, but it's still that fighting rifle. And to me, 2.5 to 10, absolutely, it's enough that I can shoot effectively in a running gun type scenario. 4X, it, I can't do it. it. It's too much. To me, 4 to 16 is kind of the abandonment of this is still a fighting rifle. And it be- more becomes like, I can back a group of dudes up in a fight, but I can't be on that front line of the fight, so to speak. That's something that I I probably should self-reflect a little bit. I think I was sort of dazzled by the desert in a sense, right? Like I'm, we're, But we're also not going to shoot in the desert. No one's going to live in the desert, right? We're, we're practicing the most extreme right. ranges of these systems. We're probably only going to be punching out to 4, 450, 500 in an urban-esque environment, you know? Assuming that that shot even presents itself. Now that makes sense because yeah, I think I am. I think I'm getting a little lost in the min maxing aspect of it. Like uh, I want to go back out there and I want to go to 700 and I want to do better at 700 than I did at 600. So I'm like, okay, what do I want? I want more magnification for that, right? But the reason we shoot in the desert or in the middle of the fucking woods is because nobody's out there. That makes it a very uh, unrealistic scenario because nobody fights over nothing ever in history no one has ever fought over nothing except maybe for a couple weeks during the vietnam war but that was a different story altogether most of the shooting that i do i mean or most of my environment is is very close in so in that sense what the modern civilian spr not a military clone but the modern spr it wouldn't be a bad idea to cut some barrel length but it might be a bad idea to over scope it we built these rifles based on a theory. We took them out there and we put that theory into practice and it confirmed some of our, you know, some of our assumptions, some of our design goals and also perhaps showed us that we were getting a little too into the game. Everyone Thank loves you. the mantra of mission drives the gear. But fundamentally, a civilian that is using a rifle outside of home defense, the government's probably fucked off at some point. There never really is a true mission. You might have some objectives, but we don't have missions uh, in the same degree that a military has a mission. So there is a degree of versatility required with your weapon. So the lesson really is that if the SPR becomes over-specialized, it becomes more or less a range toy. But if you keep it versatile, which is the original design goal, then it does have some utility. It can be the rifle that you grab and go with because it doesn't compromise too much. God, this outro fucking blows. How about this? How about this? Let's let's try a different version. You should say this. I shouldn't say this, but you should say, all right, honestly, I think that's a good point to cut it off at. Those were some thoughts, some organized, some not organized regarding some dudes trying out a precision setup 556 platform. This was formatted in the context of how we usually do podcasts. Speaking of podcasts, this isn't the first. We've done God knows how many now, 12, 13, 14, and they're all available to you. However, uh, this stuff ain't cheap to run, and we kind of do this for fun. And as a thank you to our community, especially those that support us, and this is available to you on our subscribe star at the $5 tier. So if you'd like to support us and get a little thank you as an aside, hey, consider heading over to subscribe star and seeing a lot more of these videos typically more drunk typically more incoherent typically a lot more fun dude i'm not gonna remember all that i had to get the throw neutralized was this nine hole